when we look at electromagnetic waves inside of um, real material, um, we look at the idealized case of linear media and we discover interesting properties. Hi, this is Jonathan Gardner. Uh, this is a very short video on section 8.23 of Griffith's Introduction to Electrodynamics. We're covering how monochromatic plane waves behave in linear media as opposed to a vacuum. Previously we calculated the energy, the pointing vector, the momentum, and the intensity of a plane wave in vacuum. We could calculate exactly what the E field and B field is going to be given some initial conditions. Um, everything is pretty much laid out for us. Now we're going to throw in the monkey wrench of what happens inside of linear media. Why linear media? Well, it, we can't really analyze anything else. And this is a good approximation for real life for many things. So, um, remember back in the beginning of chapter 8, we looked at Maxwell's equations for matter, uh, linear media, and we derived the wave equation that were derived thus, and we just discovered that we got the curious property that the velocity of the wave was equal to the speed of light divided by n, the index of refraction, and that that is equal to 1 over epsilon mu of the linear media. And so our n that we use for Snell's law is just the square root of epsilon mu over epsilon naught mu naught. So the permittivity and permeability, do I have it backwards? Who cares? Of, of the media determines our index of refraction. And so what we can do is just replace everywhere we saw epsilon naught with mu naught. Uh, epsilon naught with epsilon and mu naught with mu. And so we get the equations that are rather easy to write down. We get uh, u, the energy, is just uh, epsilon instead of epsilon naught. E naught squared cosine of kappa x minus omega t plus delta. Um, S vector is equal to C over N, the index of refraction of this u in the i-hat direction. Our momentum vector is equal to n over c, we just flip it over there, of u in the i-hat direction. And our intensity, which is the average of s, is just one-half epsilon c over n um, epsilon naught squared. And that's in the i-hat direction, but whatever. OK, easy peasy, uh, nothing hard here. The interesting bit, the second part of this section, is where we start laying the ground rules for what happens when we have two, a boundary between two different linear media. And how are we going to possibly going to solve our, how are we possibly going to solve the boundary conditions to figure out what happens when a wave bounces off or transmits through uh, one of these boundaries. And in order to do that, we have to go back to chapter seven and examine the boundary conditions. Okay. Um, so back in chapter seven, we discovered. So we have basically we have epsilon one and mu one on one side, epsilon two and mu two on the other side, and then we have our electric field one and our electric field two and our, our magnetic field one, our magnetic field two on the other sides. And we we broke it down into perpendicular and parallel components of those of those fields. Uh, the rules that we had, and I'm going to wing a little bit of this, is if we take an uh, infinitely small, a really small Gaussian box that includes the surface, the D field, which is just epsilon E, uh, jumps by the surface charge at the boundary. In our case, we're not worrying about free charge, and so we have the condition, one, that D1 has to equal D2. Um, these are not vectors. These are the perpendicular components. Um, so that implies that epsilon 1, E1, in the perpendicular direction, has to be epsilon 2, E2, in the perpendicular direction. Okay. The second rule that we derived is what happens for the perpendicular components of the B field. Well, there's no magnetic monopoles, um, so the magnetic field, you can't have, the divergence of B is zero. So basically, the perpendicular components of B have to be zero and it doesn't matter what kind of media you're using. Okay, so, and I, I'm sorry, the, the components don't have to be zero. There's no monopole charge inside of the Gaussian box that we draw for the magnetic fields. And so, um, the, the, the B field that's perpendicular to that surface must be zero. Okay, 
The next rule we found was we drew uh, little Amperian loops of sorts. Um, and we discovered that the E field that's parallel um, has to be equal. So basically, if we take a really, really small Amperian loop, we can get it so small that uh, there's, there's no, uh, anyway, there's no changing magnetic flux. And so we get that E. Um, you can shoot me if I'm wrong about this. It's a vector in the parallel direction. has to be equal to E vector for the other field in the parallel direction. Okay, and the last rule we get, rule number four in Roman numerals here, lowercase, is that if we take an infinitely small Amperian loop that just goes along the boundary there, then we discover that the 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 H field has to jump by the amount of uh, free current at the surface. And since we're dealing with situations where we don't have a free current, then our H fields cannot jump. Well, what's the H field? That's just one over which is V1 in the parallel direction divided by mu1. That has to be equal to V2 in the parallel direction divided by mu2. So these are the four rules that we're going to have to satisfy when we calculate our boundary conditions. OK, so you probably want to take those down on a note card and, and get ready for what we're going to do next. The next section is somewhat easy. The section after that, where we look at oblique incidents, is not uh, very easy at all. Um, I hope you have the patience to follow along as I go through it all. Uh, if you have questions or comments, put them in uh, the comments below. Video response is welcome. Uh, be sure to like this video so people know that it's good and be sure to share it with your friends so they can they can uh, experience the same fun you had listening to me. <laughs> anyway, um, take care. Uh, thanks for your time. Bye-bye.